Welcome everyone. My name is Betsy O'Hagan and I am your online host today for a lovely program, a live wildlife broadcast program. And before we get started, a couple of things. During the program, if you would, please keep your, mute, uh, your mic muted. If you have a question or a comment, feel free to unmute yourself and then ask the question when, uh, you know, when there's a pause in the presentation. Um, let's get started. I have a couple of slides I'd like to go through with you. Uh, and again, welcome. Our uh, presenter today is the Avian Conservation Center of Appalachia, uh, and it's done in partnership or collaboration with Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society, uh, a chapter of the National Audubon Society that is located uh, near uh, and around Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, our host today, our program host, is Katie Fallon who is the ACCA founder and an outstanding and notable author. Uh, and uh, we are delighted that you're all here. Let's go on to the next slide. Here is the um, beautiful logo of the Avian Conservation Center of Appalachia and a photo of Dr. Jesse Fallon working with one of the center's patients. We are in the Akron, Cleveland area, as I mentioned, and I thought you might appreciate um, looking, taking a look at the map. Um, the center is broadcasting live from Morgantown, West Virginia, which as we can see from the map here is just about the midway point between Washington and the Cleveland, Akron, Ohio area. The inset map shows us where the center is located specifically in Morgantown, just uh, on the bank, so to speak, of Cheat Lake. Um, the center is a part of the Cheat Lake Animal Hospital. And here you can see a picture of that campus. Uh, Cheat Lake Animal Hospital is in Morgantown, and it's a full-service veterinary hospital. They provide all kinds of services, everything from radiographs to surgery to canine rehabilitation, and I've listed those things there on the slide. I've also listed the website where you can go and learn more about the hospital, and please do go and look it up on Facebook and add your like. Here's another photo of one of the residents or patients uh, with a young wildlife uh, intern. And um, this is the kind of wonderful work that is done at the center, which is part of the hospital campus. Here are some of the patients. Uh, on the left, yeah. we can see the birds, the different right. birds. Are you getting up? Right. And I'm going to remind folks, if you would, to please mute your microphone as the program is going on. Thank you so much. If you have a question, feel free to unmute and ask your question. Um, all right, and let's go on. The center um, uh, needs uh, a lot, if you can only imagine how much a bird eats every day. and. The center uh, goes through lots and lots of resources, uh, husbandry supplies, uh, and other various supplies, which you can see in the photo on the right. Uh, garbage bags, uh, rope and twine, paper towels, uh, high energy trail mix. These are all essential items for the center, for ACCA. And uh, we're asking anyone today who's participating on the program to please consider making a donation to ACCA so that the supplies uh, and husbandry equipment can be purchased. Now, I have listed here on this next slide um, the name of the center, uh, a link for donation. And um, please do also go to the Facebook page and look for the donate button. Just click that button and it will make a direct donation to the center. 
A third way that you can make a donation is by mailing a check. And I've listed the address uh, there for you, the Avian Conservation Center of Appalachia, Attention Wildlife Rehabilitation Staff, 286 Fairchance Road in Morgantown, West Virginia, 26508. Their phone number, if you'd like to just give them a quick call, is 304-906-5438. Or just send them an email, admin at accawv.org. Um, the last thing I'd like to tell you about is that we do have a, a, a comprehensive uh, ACCA supply wish list. And you can find that uh, at the WCAS um, website. Uh, and I've uh, listed the URL there. Again, your donations support husbandry supplies, equipment, and food, which is essential to being able to care for um, the patients and residents of the Avian Conservation Center of Appalachia. So do try to make a donation. Thank you. We're going to go on now and start our program. Uh, our host again is Katie Fallon, founder of the Avian Conservation Center of Appalachia in Morgantown, West Virginia. And we're going to start out in the animal hospital. Uh, we're going to talk about medical uh, things and take a closer look at avian x-rays. We're going to meet a bird or two in rehab in the hospital. And then I understand that we're going to see physiotherapy on a hawk. And we're going to finish up by hanging out with Randolph the Eastern Screech Owl. So this should surely be a delightful program for all ages. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and I'm going to turn the active viewer over to Katie Fallon and Nicole who are at ACCA in Morgantown right now. So let me do that and then please take it away Katie. Great. Thank you so much, Betsy. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Excellent. Um, thank you very much for that excellent introduction. That was perfect. You've covered everything. <laughs> um, and we're really excited to be here. So, again, thank you, Betsy, and thank you, Western Cuyahoga Audubon, for um, doing this again for us. Uh, we always we love our friends um, in Ohio, and we're really excited that we get to talk with everyone today. Um, yeah, if at any point somebody has a question, just um, try to uh, yeah, unmute and ask during a pause uh, or wait till the end if you want or however you want to do it is okay, um, okay with us. So I'm going to go ahead and start um, talking about, some, about one of our rehab patients in a moment, but uh, just I want to introduce um, Nicole, who's next to me here, Nicole Gerhardt. Uh, one of our excellent volunteers who spends um, donates a lot of her time um, helping helping with the birds in our care. And one of the birds that we're going to talk about first is a bird that Nicole rescued a few weeks ago that um, I think uh, he might have some friends watching, so I thought that they might want to see him. So bear bear with me as I move my phone because it might sort of shake around a little bit. I should mention, too, that... Uh, we are in the we are in ACCA's um, medical room in the back of Cheat Lake Animal Hospital. So we have kind of our own room that's away from dogs and cats and other companion animals. So Nicole and I are kind of back in here right now, and this is where the birds go after they have surgery or as soon as they're admitted to the hospital. They come to this room. Um, it's sort of our you could call it kind of an intensive care room. Um, yeah, it's where we like the birds to go if they're going to need medication several times a day or if they're going to need um, to be observed by our veterinarian uh, more closely. Once the birds are stable, um, they can go up to ACCA, up to the building, um, our, our building on the same campus, but up the hill, uh, where they are uh, fed and cared for by our volunteers. Um, while they are recovering from whatever 
surgeries or illnesses they have. So but we're going to focus a little bit on the hospital today. Last time we were here and did a video with Western Cuyahoga Audubon, we focused on some of our education birds. And I thought it might be cool for everybody to see some of our birds in um, the hospital. So I'm going to go inside um, one, of our, one of our hospital cages right now. And hopefully you can hear that hissing. Um, this is a black vulture that some of his friends named Clyde. Uh, we don't know if Clyde is male or female. Um, usually with black vultures, the only way you can tell is through a DNA, a DNA test. Um, or if the bird lays an egg, obviously that's a female. But um, DNA test is uh, typically what we have to do to determine the, the um, sex of the bird. So Clyde um, has an interesting story. Folks in his neighborhood saw this bird for, I think, about two months. Um, and uh, people weren't, nobody was able to catch him, and they were having a difficult time getting uh, anybody to come out to try. Black vultures can run surprisingly fast, even if they're badly injured. Poor Clyde had been hit by a vehicle uh, and shot. So uh, his, his fracture was very serious, and we're going to talk to the veterinarian in a moment to show you um, what his extra look like and to talk about them. I'm not sure if you're able to tell in the video, but Clyde has kind of a blue thing on his wing, and that's an external fixator. And um, Dr. Fallon, my husband, um, will explain that in a minute, but Clyde is sort of, he just, he was getting medication twice a day for the last, last week, and now he's switching over to once a day medication, so he's going to be able to go up to ACCA soon um, and uh, get get us uh, cared for up, up there by our other volunteers. Uh, we're not entirely sure if the bone is going to heal or not, um, but we hope that it will. But Clyde is a pretty awesome patient. Um, black vultures are more common in the southeastern United States um, than in other regions. We have some here in West Virginia all year long, but uh, they are much more numerous in Florida, Georgia, um, along the coast. So I'm going to leave Clyde alone because even though he looks calm, I mean, he doesn't like me, even though I like him. <laughs> we all like him, yeah. but he doesn't, he doesn't really like me um, or, or anybody. But he's, black vultures tend to, be, uh, tend to do quite well under, living under human care. Um, so uh, they, can, they have quite interesting personalities. And if any of you watched um, our video from last Last time that we did for Western Cuyahoga Audubon, you got to meet Maverick, who's our black vulture, uh, our non-releasable black vulture, um, who lives with us, will live with us for the rest of his life. So I'm going to go ahead. We're going to go see Clyde's x-rays. I don't know if this bird will um, cooperate or not, but I might be able to just open this very slightly. This bird is a very new patient, um, so I'm going to try to not show him too much, um, but this is a great horned owl that just came in yesterday. Uh, so he is, um, he's, he's very fresh. So we won't bother that great horned owl too much, but great horned owls often smell like skunks when they come in because they eat skunks. And uh, he is, um, now, where did my mask go? How do I lose things that are, like, right uh, right in front of me? But um, this bird, unfortunately, not um, he has several things going on. He's um, very thin, uh, not, um, we're not sure what his ultimate fate will be. Uh, but we hope, we're hoping for the best, and he's going to start some treatment today. So I am going to... I'm going to look around for where did my mask go in the last two seconds. So hold on, hold on one second. I'm wondering if Nicole grabbed my mask accidentally. So I have my vaccines. I have my shots, um, and so does Nicole. But when we go out into the um, into the animal hospital, uh, we want to make sure that we uh, we all we have our masks on because um, uh, you know we don't want to we don't want to. <laughs> Spread, spread the virus, uh, or 
hold on one second. Do you know where my, my mask suddenly went? I handed it to you, I thought. Uh, oh, it's on the, it's on the floor. Never mind. There we go. All right, I'm going to go out into the hospital now, and Dr. Fallon is going to show you the uh, show you the X-rays. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. Taking film. I'm going to get go ahead. We're at. And I'm going to shut this door for the moment. All right. So tell us who you are. Okay, my name is uh, Jesse Fallon, and I'm partner here at Cheat Lake Animal Hospital and uh, also the director of veterinary medicine uh, for the Aiding Conservation Center of Appalachia. And uh, so Katie's probably already gone through sort of what we do in part with our rehab birds, but one of the things that we have that a lot of other uh, rehab facilities don't have is we've got 24-hour uh, access to veterinarians. And so our birds are dropped off any time, day or night, and at admission, we do our initial diagnostic workup, which for birds of prey will always include x-rays, uh, and we try to triage cases very early on to determine severity of injury, likelihood of release, and, uh, and then initially our rehabilitation birds will be down here in the hospital setting for treatments that can include fluid therapy, anti-inflammatory medication, pain medication, antibiotics, and surgery until they're stable and, and ready to go to sort of the convalescent stage of uh, rehab when they'll be moved up to the, uh, the Aiding Conservation Center building that's on property but up the hill a little bit. So, so I thought I'd just show you some x-rays today and kind of take you through what a, what a bird looks like on the inside here. Uh, one second, I'm going to... Are these the folks that actually know this bird? Okay. okay, so this is a black vulture um, that was picked up. It's going to help if we do this. Ooh, did it? Yeah, it should. Maybe. Let's see here. Maybe not. Go ahead and turn that light on. Sorry, the iPhone's trying to figure out how to look at an image here. It's not translating very well. It's probably all right, isn't it? Yeah, Betsy says it's all right. Okay. All right, so um, <coughs> this is a black vulture that was brought in on, looks like, uh, early April. Um, the bird that was recovered uh, near Baltimore. And uh, I don't know how good the detail is here. I'm going to zoom in for you and see if this helps a little bit. Um, this is the bird's what we call the thoracic uh, girdle in the upper half of the bird here. And I'll use a pen since you probably can't see my mouse very well. Uh, but the detail is quite fine and, uh, on these x-rays. And so we can see very closely into the joint space and even inside the medullary canals of the bones. Um, but uh, your fracture site on this bird is on this wing here. Uh, this bird was, was gunshot, and there's multiple metal fragments at the location of the fracture, which is mid-shaft humerus. There's an old fracture that's further up on the uh, radius of the bird's uh, antebrachium or forearm, and then uh, gunshot fragments present in, along the wing in multiple, multiple places. And so um, this was an old fracture. This fracture was probably on the order of weeks old. Uh, it, has, it is dramatically over reduced so it's it's displaced. The bone is about half the length of what it should be. And so the challenge here was to regain the length of this bone and also try to get the edges fresh enough that they'll attempt to heal across the line. So this bird's prognosis for even fracture healing is what I would consider guarded, meaning it very well may not form a bony union. Um, uh, because of the duration of the injury, along with the, the high impact nature of the gunshot. And so with fracture repair in birds, we use a technique called external skeletal fixation. 
Uh, and in this case, we do what's called an open reduction, which means we, we do approach the, the fracture surgically. These muscles and tendons are all very contracted from the length of injury, and, uh, and the bone edges have to be debrided. So, um, so after a, a quite a bit of time, meticulous dissection and getting this thing stretched back out with pretty heavy traction, we've got really pretty good alignment here and regained the overall length of the bone and secured it with some external skeletal fixator pins and, and what this looks like. Did they see the bird? Yeah. You could see the blue bar on the outside of the wing and maybe some hint of the pins as they entered the bone. Um, all of these implants will be removed after healing, which will take, usually with a fresh fracture, by week four, you expect to have full bony union. This bird might take a little bit longer before we decide whether it's going to heal or not. Um, but certainly by week six, we're going to know if this, these implants are going to come out and either this bird is going to have a bony union across this line or it's not. Um, and uh, that'll sort of be the, the one, one shot that this bird has to, to have any functional uh, wing on that side. Uh, so then after surgery, we maintain pain control with uh, anti-inflammatory medication along with some other adjunctive therapies like tramadol or gabapentin that if any of you have had any uh, joint work done or, or major orthopedic surgery, you're probably familiar with those the same drugs that are used in humans. Um, and then antibiotic therapy because this was a, uh, a gunshot and was a, a long surgery, so there's potential risk for infection. So they'll usually stay down in the hospital for about a week, and then they'll be transferred uh, up to uh, ACCA uh, volunteer building where they'll be they'll be maintained on, on medication up there. So uh, I don't know if there's if this is interactive. If you guys have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. So that's sort of the veterinary component here, and then after fracture repair, after one week, we expect to have some bony or some fibrous tissue that is forming. And so one of the most important parts, again, if any of you have been through any joint operation, is physical therapy. And so uh, physiotherapy in our orthopedic patients is critical. They're going to get contracture of the tendons and elbows and reduce range of motion. And these birds, if they're going to be released, they don't, you know, they don't, we don't, we're not trying to just get to 80%. These birds have got to be able to go out and fly, find food. Uh, evade predators, and so they got to be at an athletic performance prior to release, and so physiotherapy becomes ever more important. So our volunteer, Nicole, is going to be doing some physiotherapy on a red tail hawk that had surgery, I believe, five weeks ago um, for a, a fracture of the radius and ulna, and I'm going to talk about it. All right, so we will go there next. Here you go, guys. Sorry. No, no, you're fine. I'm okay. really you guys can go back and no, we're going here now. <laughs> All right. So this bird is uh, uh, currently under an inhalant anesthetic called isoflurane. So these are these can be painful uh, to some extent. You know, you got to you got to push these joints a little bit in order to get your flexibility back. So um, so we put them under anesthesia to reduce both behavioral stress but also to allow us to push on these wings without causing a lot of uh, uh, discomfort. So uh, so the bird's hooked up to an anesthetic machine here and uh, sort of just getting under anesthesia currently. There, working on the bird. Yeah, Katie, why don't you crank that up to four there? All right, so the bird's on his back. The fractured wing is this one. So the, all the implants are out from this bird. And so the primary goal, and he's still getting a little sleepy, so I'm not going to push him too hard yet. But we're trying to regain this elbow flexion, elbow extension, sorry. And this bird is probably, right now, only about 10 has maybe 10% reduced extension from where it would be normally, so we're almost there. And during physical therapy, we're going to extend this wing and put pressure on the back of this humerus and stretch the tendons that are across the elbow. This is the same joint that humans will get contracture on 
uh, if, if they're in, immobilized too long. So we want them to be up and, and stretching. So we'll do this uh, at least once weekly, if not more, in the post-op period uh, to help. And actually, in any really, we start week one post-op and then continue through for, for a while um, until they're back to sort of normal normal extension. And then test flying or exercise flying on what we call Creon's line, which is a falconry, old falconry technique to train birds for hunting. We use the same strategy for our birds for exercise. Uh, Dr. Fallon, this is Betsy. I have a question here from Gary. Yes. Gary sure. asks, is this another gunshot wound? This is a hit by car uh, hit by car patient, that's the most common injury that, or the most common traumatic injury we see is hit by car patients. And these birds, like red-tailed hawks, for example, um, I'm vaccinated, so I'm going to take my mask off so you can hear me a little better. So these birds, um, you'll see them along the highway very frequently, and most commonly in the winter time is when people recognize them, in part because there are more birds that can be in certain locations. Uh, because they don't have territories established. And so sometimes you can see red tails every three or four miles on the interstate in the wintertime, but also because the deciduous trees, of course, are bare of leaves, so you can see them. So these birds are often will hunt along edges or near meadows, and if they picture that highway running by, the median is nicely mowed, or it has sometimes native wildflowers that the state plants. So that's great habitat for prey species like rodents, rabbits in some bird species, and so they'll sit on those conveniently placed road signs or um, light fixtures or the trees at the border of the woods, and they'll fly down and hunt that meeting, and that's, you know, when they've got excellent binocular vision, um, but of course they haven't evolved with cars flying by at 80 miles an hour, so when they go after that prey item, you know, they're not looking or peripheral to get hit from the periphery. So that's the most common injury. We do still see gunshot birds, though, um, and uh, we certainly get several every year um, of all species, mostly diurnal raptors or daytime raptors like vultures and hawks. Um, occasionally we may get an owl with an injury like that. And then lots of crows, lots of our crow and raven admissions are also gunshot birds, and that sort of sort of categorizes those species. Thank you, Dr. Fallon. We have another question from Anne. Mm -hmm. Anne's question is, how do you know how much sedation to use? For yeah, pain, good, for pain management, question. how do you know when they need more or less meds? Yeah, Thank you, it's Anne. A, it's a good question, and the short answer is identifying pain in, in, in any of our non-human species can be difficult. It's really difficult in birds of prey. You know, pain sort of became the, the, a vital sign in human medicine, you know, several years ago. And so they always ask you, rate your pain on a scale of one to 10. Or if you're in a pediatric, you know, physician, they'll have a picture on the wall with smiley faces and they have the kid point to it. Even a two-year-old can tell you that. Our patients cannot. And so we, we, we always assume if, if we think there could be pain, we treat for it. And so we err on the side of, of medicating. Um, you can check heart rates. Most of the time, painful animals are going to have an elevated heart rate. Um, you can check for signs of behavioral stress, which the, the trainers could tell you better than I could, but things like open mouth breathing, for example, um, could indicate pain. Um, so it's difficult. We just assume that basically every bird that comes in with trauma is getting Meloxicam anti-inflammatory. If it has a wound, it's getting an antibiotic. And if it has an orthopedic procedure, we're going to at least give some opioids perioperatively. Um, but there, is, there really is no, there is no golden rule of, you know, this is a clinical sign of pain in a bird of prey. They're, they're very stoic animals by nature. And so um, uh, the only studies that are out there in birds use, you, that have really looked at pain is mostly in parrots and chickens, and what the studies have done is they put them on essentially a, a perch that has heat, and they and they and they can turn the temperature up and see when the bird moves off of the perch, and they indicate that they assume then they have pain, and then if you give a population of birds a pain med and you see how long they stand on the perch, then you can get some objective 
sense of where that is, but it's it's almost it's very difficult to determine that. Thank you, Dr. Fallon. And folks, if anyone else has a question, please, um, as I said, unmute your mic and feel free to ask or post it in the chat and we'll, we'll ask it for you. Thank you for your good questions. Okay, I want to know where you are, Betsy, if that's a fake background or if you're somewhere tropical. Someone probably already <laughs> asked you that. <laughs> oh, don't, don't I wish. No, I, I, I could... I could tell you that I'm on the southern shores of Lake Erie, but that would not be true. I am, but the picture is not on the southern shores of Lake Erie. <laughs> okay. All right. So Nicole's working on this bird. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions that come up. And Katie's been doing it long enough. She can probably answer most of the questions that I can, too. All right. So excuse, somebody, excuse me. I'm sorry. This is Betsy. Uh, yeah. We do. Terry has a question. Thank you, Terry, yeah. for your question. The question is: Do you know if Clyde was shot with a BB gun or what? So, yeah. So the vulture. Um, th there's a. There are. There are actually. There are three areas that have metal fragments in it. One, the bird had an old fracture of the radius that had healed. I don't think that was at the same time as the humeral fracture, but I can't be certain. And there is a met there's a very fine um, metal opacity on that X-ray in that wing. Um, there's definitely a metal opacity at the level of the humeral fracture, and then there's a big pellet that does resemble a pellet, like from a pellet gun, that's a, a, a remnant shrapnel. Um, so I don't know. My my guess is is that pellet appearance is actually a, a mushroom, a mushroom piece of lead from a very small caliber rifle is my guess, but I'm I'm no expert in that. Um, but that would be my guess because there's, it, it had to fragment, so it has to be something like a lead shot. It's not steel, and, and because there's multiple locations, it makes me think that there probably was a through-and-through -through injury that may have one single projectile may have fractured the humerus and then got lodged further down and then had that mushroom effect of the pellet um, is my guess. Okay. Thank you. Mm-hmm. All right, I think I think we might be almost done with Jesse, right? Yeah. Uh, for now, and I, I, um, my plan is to next, if everybody is okay with it, um, my plan is to wander outside and meet our little screech owl, who I ho hopefully is back there waiting for me, waiting for us. Um, and I'm going to leave Nicole to finish this physiotherapy, um, and she's still she's still working on this talk. Um, so thank you very much, Nicole. Bye, everyone. <laughs> All right, and I'm gonna I'm gonna go back into the hospital, <laughs> and then we'll go outside. Uh, Katie, this is Betsy. As we're tra as you're traveling, I have another question from Kelly. Okay. Kel Kelly's question is: When testing how well they will be able to fly after surgery, where does that take place to keep them from getting away? Ah, so we use something um, on our large birds, we use a creance, which um, is sort of like a kite string. So we attach sort of a, sort of a paracord, paracord uh, to the bird's legs, um, and it's on a big spool, and we go out into a large open field, and we let the bird fly um, on this creance, and it's it's a, uh, and then we just have to sort of gently pull the cord, gently bring the bird down before it gets to any trees, um, or something like that. Uh, it's it's um, you know, to really get a bird flying long distances, you'd have to have an enormous enclosure. Um, or a or a or a something circular like a continuous flight barn, um, which would be really cool to have. We just don't have one, so we rely on the um, creons creons flying. Uh, so, so there, I'm walking. Thank, th thank you. Excuse me. I've got another question, oh, Katie. Oh, sure. Go ahead. Uh, from from Pat Patricia, 
And okay. Patricia's question is, is lead poisoning a problem with the gunshot injuries? That's a very good question. Thank you, Patricia. That, that is a good question. Not typically. Typically, lead poisoning is a problem when the bird eats the lead. Um, and the lead gets into the stomach and the digestive tract. Sometimes, um, I think, sometimes you can get lead toxicity if the bullet is um, in, a, in a joint, but uh, not, we have not seen lead toxicity from a gunshot. Uh, lead toxicity that we see is when the lead has been ingested. So we're not, uh, we don't generally have to worry about lead toxicity with shot. It's just that they eat the lead, um, which they sometimes do inadvertently. If a, if a vulture or an eagle uh, or a hawk is eating at a carcass or a like gut pile, um, which a gut pile, you know, that's like a bonanza, you know, if you're a scavenging bird. Um, but unfortunately, if there are small pieces of lead um, in the gut pile, the bird can swallow them um, with, inadvertently and then become sick from it. So that's usually... Um, how we see lead toxicity in birds. So, I'm going to, if everybody's okay, I'm going to show you um, my little friend, two friends. One is bigger, one is little. <laughs> uh, I'm going to go switch you to this way. So this is this is um, Cheyenne Carter, and she's a bird trainer here at the ACCA. And her little friend is Randolph the Eastern Screech Owl. Um, and Randolph uh, was hit by a vehicle when he was a very young bird, and he can't see well enough to return to the wild. So unfortunately, Randolph um, is, uh, has a permanent home here at ACCA. I say unfortunately, because we would rather have him be out in the wild but he um, he is uh, a great educational ambassador for us, um, and he is very has a very good relationship with Cheyenne. And you can see she's feeding him a little, or trying to feed him. He's very very half-heartedly eating some mealworms, and he also has some pieces of mice. So we <laughs> he's saying they don't want that Cheyenne. <laughs> so we train our birds. Uh, using positive positive reinforcement, uh, operant conditioning. So Cheyenne has spent a lot of time with Randolph, uh, building the relationship, um, building the relationship, building trust, getting Randolph to the point where you know he wants to participate. Uh, we we give our birds a choice whether or not they want to participate with our training sessions. Um, almost always they do. Um, like uh, like Randolph here. Randolph almost, I'm not sure Randolph has ever said no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Randolph has been with us for about three years. And uh, we, screech owls, um, probably a 10 year old screech owl in the wild would be a pretty old screech owl. But so Randolph, Randolph is still a youngster. Um, and we hope that we can have him for many years. He's named Randolph after Randolph County, which is where he was found injured. And he is a, a red or a rufous morph screech owl. They're also, they also come in sort of a gray color. Screech owls are one of our most common patients here at the ACCA. We usually see 20 or 30 every year. Uh, they're very, very common. You don't see them often because they blend in remarkably well, but they are, um, a very common bird in the eastern U.S. They can be right in your backyard. They only need a few trees, uh, and they nest in a hollow tree, so you can put up a birdhouse that looks sort of like a large bluebird box, and you might be able to attract an eastern screech owl to nest in your yard. They eat a wide variety of prey. They're uh, very um, generalists on what they eat, Anything mouse size or smaller, an eastern screech owl might try to eat, including insects uh, like moths or um, other insects flying at night. They'll eat small reptiles uh, and amphibians. They'll eat crayfish. Uh, they've documented them trying to catch bats. Um, 
and again, in mice, moles, anything, anything about small mouse size or smaller, a screech owl might try to eat. Roosting birds. Um, here at ACCA, Randolph eats uh, mice, chicks, some baby rats, mealworms, and waxworms. And then he'll occasionally get something else, like a little piece of deer meat, um, if we have some, uh, or little pieces of fish, maybe. Um, he might like those, too. Uh, if we have a big cicada, cicada hatch, like some parts of the country are going to have the 17-year cicadas come out, uh, screech owls would eat um, cicadas in the wild also. So if we get some, we might feed some to Randolph. So um, I, don't, I don't have a, uh, I can't see what time it is on my phone right now, but I suspect that, Betsy, we might be getting, I don't want to go over, um, over our time. I suspect we're getting close, right? It's about 12.44, Katie. All right. And are we, are we supposed to end at 12.45? It, it, it really depends on how much time you have. That's fine. Uh, whatever you have time for. Does it, and while we're pausing, is there anyone here who has another question? Uh, again, please feel free to unmute your microphone and ask or uh, post it in the chat. Any other questions? <laughs> Randolph is a professional. <laughs> he's been doing this for a while, and he's a he's got a great relationship with Cheyenne, and I'd like to think with me too, but mostly Cheyenne. But he's he's pretty good with just about everybody. Some of our birds have favorites. Um, Randolph sort of likes everybody. Oh, uh, Katie, can you tell us what other resident birds you have there? Sure, and actually, I can walk up the hill to to um while we're talking to see if there's more birds we can look at. And that, look that, would, that would be wonderful. I do have some comments right. I can read while you're watching. Sure. Sure. Um, Anne said, this is wonderful. It is evident that you love your jobs. Oh, Kelly, yeah. <laughs> Kelly said that Randolph is beautiful. He is beautiful. Uh, he's he's um, a wonderful little bird. We love Randolph. He's very sassy. Uh, he... He has a huge personality for being such a little guy. And you might, you might notice, too, that um, Randolph is choosing to stay with Cheyenne. He's not actually on a leash or tethered. Um, he's just, he's trained to do this, and he has the choice to not. Hmm. To not. Um, but uh, because we trust him so much and... Um, you know, we we are confident in his training that uh, we can take him out without equipment on. Mm -hmm. And we're working on flying yes. outside with him. We're working on training him to fly from a from glove to glove and from a perch to a glove. We think that kids will love to see that um, whenever we're allowed to go back to do programs. <laughs> so he's, well, that, um, that's that's quite a view there of the campus. Are you able oh, yeah. to scan the view slowly sure. for us okay. so we can see? I don't know if that's the best location, but uh, where, wherever so yeah. that we can see. Again, folks, this is being broadcast live from Morgantown, West Virginia, which is about halfway between the Cleveland, Akron, Ohio area and, um, and, and uh, Washington and the Baltimore area. And, and that, actually, where I'm going to go next is probably an even uh, an even better way to give you a view of the campus here. Great. Um, so let me let me walk up the hill uh, that I can kind of give you an, an overview. Um, yes, we are. We're outside of, of Morgantown near Cheat Lake, and we're going to say bye to Cheyenne and Randolph. Um, mm -hmm. so they're going to go inside. <laughs> it's cold out here today. Here in Morgantown. Um, so, my nose is running. So, where I am up here, this is probably a better place to give you a, an overview. So, uh, Cheat Lake Animal Hospital um, is the building you're seeing right here. And it's a very large structure. It used to, it's, it's built around a small A-frame house that's, um, I think, about 100 years old. And they added 
You can see the maybe the original chimneys of the house kind of in the middle there. The ones that look like stone. Uh, and then um, they've added to it over the years. And uh, this is another building here um, above the animal hospital where we do our rehab work. And it's, this is like a, a, a great spot on a hill. We've got a lot of vultures that fly around here. And behind the animal hospital uh, is actually the, the back, this, back this direction is, is the edge of Cooper's Rock State Forest. Oh. So it's really nice to have this. Um, uh, nobody, you know, can build right behind us. Of course, we can't build further that direction either because of the state forest. The animal hospital has, I think, 20, 20 or 21 doctors, and it's open 24 hours. So it's a very, it is a very busy place. Um, they're always, uh, always busy and looking to grow. So I'm going to see, I'm going to see if this bird will um, let you see him. So everybody can see this bird, right? And this is, of course, a bald eagle. And maybe you're thinking, gosh, you showed us, you know, vultures and other stuff first. Why didn't you show us this guy? So this this eagle um, is one who, uh, unfortunately, um, can't return to the wild. Uh, he had a fracture and bad soft tissue injury um, to his right wing. And um, we're not entirely sure what happened. But we think that he uh, was in a fight with another eagle. Um, eagles can be very territorial. And uh, he can fly a, a little bit, but unfortunately his wing is just never going to work well enough for him to return to the wild. So um, he's officially still um, a rehab bird for us, but uh, we have paper uh, permit pending to keep him um, to use for education. But it's uh, uh, not not through yet um, so we're just kind of waiting to hear if we can if we can keep him to use for education he is um, I, I don't know I know this sounds weird to say but this is the nicest calmest bald eagle that I think I've ever um, seen or that that uh, that has come into ACCA he's just a wonderful bird um, he's got he just got fed he's got some fish um, over on his feeding platform it looks like he ate some of it but not he hasn't finished it yet uh, but he really is a great bird, um, and we're, we're hopeful that we will get to um, give him a, a permanent home here. Uh, we certainly love him. He's got a nice big enclosure, <laughs> and he's talking right now. Ooh. He's talking. <laughs> and that's the sound a bald eagle makes. <laughs> it's not the, the other sound that you always hear in the movies is the red tail of hawk call. So what this, this bird is sort of like the... Uh, sort of like the greeter at Walmart. He, um, every time somebody parks in the parking lot or walks along the path, he greets them like that. And at first we thought maybe it was, um, you know, maybe he wasn't um, happy, uh, but but he doesn't seem stressed out by people walking around and, and he just kind of, kind of chirps to everybody. And something funny about this eagle, too, he's got a bird feeder right outside, right outside his window here that, that he just sort of sits and watches this bird feeder um, all 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 day. It's like his entertainment. Um, and the birds the the birds come and eat, and they're only you know ten feet from this bald eagle, and uh, they've gotten accustomed to him, and and he seems to sit and watch them all day. The blue jays and the cardinals flying into this bird feeder. So, um, it's, I probably should finish up soon and let everybody go, uh, but if but I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have if anybody has questions still. Thank you, Katie. This is so awesome. Uh, we have a comment from Gary. Gary said he is the cleanest, healthiest eagle in captivity he's ever seen. I thank you, Gary. I think that you're right. I mean, he is a, he's a wonderful eagle, and we, we love him, and we, we try to take the best care of him that we can. Oh, that's great. Does anyone else here have any other questions before we, we proceed to closing? Nicole is back, too. <laughs> Hi, Nicole. Any I'm other good. questions? A good bet. Okay. Terry, Terry has a question. Terry's okay. question is, how do you figure out where 
these birds go when they become educational birds? Do zoos oh, take them sometimes? Yes, that's a great question. So uh, depending on the species, it can be easy or difficult <laughs> to place the birds. Um, and we also, uh, we also have to think about uh, where we place birds depending on the individual bird and the species. And we also have to think about the birds, the nature of the birds' injuries and the age of the bird. Usually young birds are better candidates for um, living under human care than uh, adult birds. And usually birds that uh, um, are able to uh, fly at least a little bit are, are usually better candidates than birds that are not totally non-flighted. Um, sometimes birds with big amputations are not great um, candidates for, for life under human care. They bang their wings against the um, sides of the enclosures, uh, which is not good for, not good. Um, but uh, there are some lists, some list serves that were places where you can post birds looking for homes. But, but between, um, between a lot of us who work here, we, can, we usually know enough people that we can uh, find spots for them. Um, so far, I don't think we've ever had, I don't think we've ever not been able to place a bird that we were hoping to place somewhere. Um, so we, we've sent birds as far away as California uh, for, for permanent homes. Um, in Florida, we have a bird at Tur we sent a bird to Turtle Bay Exploration Park in uh, Redding, California, uh, a barred owl, and we sent a screech owl to the Jacksonville Zoo. Uh, the Maryland State Park uh, Scales and Tails program um, has a lot of our quite a few of our non-releasable birds um, in their program uh, at different state parks. So it's um. So we, we, every bird's an individual, and every bird has to be evaluated for how it's going to survive um, living under human care for the rest of its life. We want, we want the birds to be as healthy and as well cared for and not, not stressed out as possible. Thank you. Uh, Winnie said thank you for your time and compassion. Oh. Well, thank Any you, everybody, for watching. Uh, and let's see. Terry said as far as Clyde. Could it be possible for him to go to the Baltimore Zoo? Um, I'm not sure. Um, it sort of depends on it depends on who needs a black vulture. Um, you know, certainly we would try to uh, if there's a if if he's not releasable and his wing heals enough where he'll be comfortable living under human care, uh, we would try to find places near nearby because we know he has a lot of fans who probably would like to visit him if possible. Um, we got to get that bone to heal uh, before we can make any, you know, determinations about about that, but but it, but if he's going to be comfortable under human care, we try to get him somewhere where his fans uh, can come see him. Very good. I, well, I'm so happy that he has so many friends. Uh, vultures need more friends, and they usually, they often will have this, you know, bad reputation, and, and vultures are, my favorite birds are vultures. Um, they're just wonderful. Uh, they do great service for the ecosystem by removing um, dead animals and uh, helping to stop the spread of disease. Um, they're very, very important for ecosystem health, um, and they don't, they, they don't, get enough credit for it, I don't think. So I'm really glad that he has so many friends. That's wonderful. So oh, thank you. Thank you, that's, friends of that's Clyde. That's great. Um, uh, uh, just one, uh, one last couple things. Terry said, if his bone doesn't heal, then what? Well, then we have to, we have to, uh, I mean, we have to talk to the veterinarian about it. Uh, if his bone, he can't, he can't survive comfortably with a non-union fracture, uh, it would be it'd be you know inhumane for us to do that to him. Painful, pa every painful every day. Uh, if you think about if you think about your humerus being being like broken, two. yeah, they would slide and yeah, you can't. They would be completely inhumane and yeah. So uh, we'd have to talk to the veterinarian about it. I mean, 
we're just really hopeful that we don't have to we don't have to go there. We're hopeful that the bone heals, even if it heals badly. Uh, as long as it stays in place. If it stays in place, yeah, that's what we need to see happen. Um, there are actually federal regulations against amputating above, uh, I think, I believe it's the elbow joint. So he's not a candidate for amputating either um, because the bone is too far, the break is too, too, too far up on his wing. Uh, but hopefully, um, you know, hopefully we can get that, get that wing to, that fracture to bridge so we don't have to make any sad, you know, mm -hmm. sad decisions. And we know, we'll know more like four weeks after his surgery. Yeah. Yeah, it's a little bit too soon. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll know. We'll keep everybody updated on him. He's certainly not, he's certainly not having a bad time though right now, so. <laughs> He well, eats all of his he eats all of his food and he gets his meds and he um he doesn't complain very often. <laughs> well, very good. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, all attendees, everyone who could come. Adrena said thank you. Very informative. Uh, and uh, we'd like to thank you, Katie and Nicole. Thank you for giving us this wonderful tour. Uh, before we go, I'm going to share my screen again, uh, which has the information about uh, how you can contact the center, where you can make a donation, and which we hope you will do. And uh, let me let me share my screen right now. Thank you so much again, Katie and Thank Nicole. You. Thank you very much. Thank you, Betsy. All right. Uh, hang on just a moment. All right, I'm going to go through. Please make a generous donation. Uh, wildlife rehabilitation specialists are some of today's unsung heroes and heroines. And really, working under tremendous pressure, they continue to aid and assist wildlife despite the crippling effects of climate change that are, is now compounded by the social and economic complications of COVID-19. Uh, so I'd like to uh, go through this slide. Again, please make a, a generous donation uh, to the, and I've listed several ways that you can do that, to the ACCA, it's a 501c3 nonprofit organization. You can donate to the ACCAWV.org contact page. You can also go to the Facebook page and there will be a donate button link there. You can click the donate button and, and make a donation directly to the center's bank account. A third way that you can do it is to mail a check and you can mail the check to the Avian Conservation Center of Appalachia, Attention Wildlife Rehabilitation Staff, 286 Fairchance Road, Morgantown, West Virginia, 26508. Or you can give them a call at phone, phone number 304-906-5438 or send an email, admin at accawv.org. Uh, you can see their supply wish list of equipment resources and husbandry supplies uh, by going to the article Live Bird and Wildlife Rehabilitation. I've listed the title there for you and that's at the wcaudubon.org website or follow that shortened link there. Here's a photo of some of the supplies that are needed. Uh, trash bags, high energy, uh, trail mix snaps, snacks, paper towels, rope, any of these these things. And again, they're listed at the ACCA's supply wish list at that link. Uh, thank you again to Katie uh, Fallon and Nicole and Dr. Jesse Fallon uh, at the hospital. There's another lovely picture uh, with one of the resident birds. And if you would like to watch a program, uh, you can do so by going to YouTube uh, and uh, you can see all of the programs there. 
again, thank you so much. The Avian Conservation Center of Appalachia. Go and visit their website, accawv.org, and, uh, and make a contribution. Connect up with them on social media. Get the word out. And thank you so much for attending, everyone. Bye-bye.